million pounds of steel and coal harnessed together furnish the power that drives Rio Grande's scenic limited westbound over towering continental divide. Through rugged Tennessee Pass, 10,240 feet of elevation in a land of Herculean proportions. Down a granite vertebra of the backbone of the North American continent into color-splashed canyons modeled with spruce and pine. Evergreen sponges that retard the rush of water from eternal snows. Mile after mile, our route parallels the Colorado River, a swift-flowing palette that catches the myriad colors of nature's endless parade of beauty, a surging guide that leads us across Colorado's boundary at dusk into Utah. Now, a mysterious land of empurpled distances, shadow-tinted by a retreating sun. Rhythmic wheels symphonize the lullaby of flanges and rails, desert night and sky spangles, past small way stations, on to a dawn destination, Arches National Monument, which is reached from a tiny desert outpost, Thompson, Utah. Flame scarlet rays herald the approach of a desert morning, and we are on our way by horseback to the Arches, a complex group of sandstone portals ranging in size from peepholes to great openings through which armies could march. Everywhere they exhibit a wizardry of sculpture, great bowls of sandstone, perfectly engineered. Spectacular rock visions dominating this vast desert domain. The giant openings are natural windows through which we view an enchanted land. Red rocks and sagebrush reaching out to the mighty snow-capped LaSalle Mountains. Like a fantastic scene from the Arabian Nights, we succumb to the spell of a desert witchery and are enthralled by an unbelievable processional, a parade of elephants, mighty stone pachyderms, as if waiting the appearance of a bejeweled potentate. This is a world of magic windows, grotesque grandeur created by wind and erosion. The desert possesses an impelling force. Miles of pale yellow sand lift themselves to meet a sky band of faraway cliffs. An indescribable vastness softened now by the waning purple and molten silver shadows of a departing day. Aboard the Scenic Limited again, through ebony darkness, into Utah's great Carbon County coal region. Bound for Castle Gate, imposing entrance to the Wasatch Plateau. Gray sandstone projections atop the canyon ridges guard the bituminous wealth of this section. Enough coal to supply the entire United States for 250 years. It is estimated almost 196 billion tons of coal remain to be mined and the fact that 45% reaches out-of-state markets makes for an endless parade of coal-laden gondolas up and down mountain graves. The coal resources of Utah are enormous, with one-fifth of the state underlaid with this valuable combustible mineral. Utah coal, black magic that fires the furnaces of progress. Lunch, a pleasant interlude, tasty dishes spiced with fleeting scenes. 
up to Soldier Summit, over 7,000 feet high, the crest of the Wasatch Plateau. Here the railroad reaches its highest Utah elevation, and what was once the scene of Indian warfare is now a busy mountain crossroad. Passengers and commerce moving east and west over a modern double-track system, a quartet of steel arteries reaching into infinity. and it's down to Provo, Utah's third largest city. A scene of great agricultural activity, Provo testifies to the reclamation of the desert. A bronze plaque commemorates the historic trek of Father Escalante, priest and pathfinder, who entered this region in 1776. Failing in his effort to find a shorter route between the missions at Santa Fe and Monterey, Escalante was nonetheless overawed by the commanding picture of Mount Timpanogos, which the Indians called the Sleeping Princess. Over 12,000 feet high, it is a perpetual spillway for the crystal cold liquid snow rushing to assimilate itself with Utah Lake, the largest body of fresh water in the state and the fountainhead of Utah's vast and important enterprise, irrigation. To the Mormon settlers, this lake was the Sea of Galilee in their new Holy Land, supplying water for Utah's River Jordan. To provide a steady flow, powerful pumps are utilized so that man is enabled to cooperate with nature in perpetuating the transformation of once barren Salt Lake Valley. And like the biblical River Jordan, this stream too has its Dead Sea, emptying into the Great Salt Lake. Modern irrigation traces its beginning to that July day in 1847 when advanced scouts of Brigham Young's party plowed ground and began what is generally accepted as the first irrigation project by Anglo-Saxons on this continent. Pioneer foresight and frontier ingenuity have wrought a miracle. Irrigation ditches fed by rivers and streams traverse once waterless valleys. A parched land drinks its fill of gurgling waters. Responding with an amazing fertility, Utah soil produces, with the possible exception of citrus fruits, any farm product grown elsewhere in North America. One of the oldest and most important agricultural pursuits is the cultivation of sugar beets, giving Utah high rank as a producer of beet sugar. Liquid sunlight gurgles and sings with the cool seduction of flowing water, bestowing a new sense of beauty. of cherry blossoms are dreamy avenues of fragrance, spreading out in broad, open meadows of color. Ethereal petals of pink, delicately tinted by the radiance of a morning sun, create a fairyland pastoral scene with an air of biblical peace and serenity. These are the children of earth and water, decking themselves in petal splendor saluting the birth of a desert empire. Copperton, Utah, the model city that copper built with its copper shingled homes, is the approach to Bingham, famous mining town with its seven mile long canyon street, a narrow lane sprouting frame dwellings. Located 25 miles southwest from modern Salt Lake City, Bingham still utilizes a one horsepower mail delivery system, with the result that mail is picked up and delivered in real old western style.
Our next objective is the mine headquarters of the Utah Copper Company. For many years, the scene of feverish activity. Small cable haul trams provide an inclined ascent for several hundred feet, permitting us unrestricted vision of this little town. So vast are the mining operations here, it is necessary to board yet another vehicle, this time the caboose of a supply train, to see the world's largest open-cut copper mine. What a spectacle. This man-made wonder, an immense amphitheater-like quarry, terraced with 23 benches or working levels, each 70 feet high. The mine covers an operating area of 475 acres. It is 1,600 feet from the crest to the floor of the pit, which is encircled with miles of railroad track, over which electric engines haul ore cars of 80 and 100 ton capacity. First prospected in 1862 by United States soldiers, it remained dormant until the period of the Spanish-American War, when Colonel Daniel C. Jackling, realizing its great possibilities, made his preliminary efforts to create this awe-inspiring project. Like the fabled ventures of Egyptian pharaohs, this great enterprise, too, depends upon manpower, and more than 4,000 are employed when operating at peak capacity to handle a single day's output of 70,000 tons of low-grade copper ore. Enough mineral in one day to fill 824 cars, equivalent to a train almost five miles long, and that's mining. Terrace and trestle cross and recross this massive mineral basin. Until 1938, more than 266 million cubic yards of material was removed from this enormous mine, a staggering feat, exceeding the total excavations for the Panama Canal by more than 20 million cubic yards. A blasting preliminary is the loading and shooting of spring holes, a prologue to the stupendous multiple explosion. Mechanical molds, electric churn drills, burrow into the earth. A chain of holes, each approximately 23 feet in depth. Fearless powder monkeys nonchalantly pack the small but mighty capsules of ammonium nitrate powder into the apertures. Enough explosive to literally move the earth. And here it goes! What an explosion. Thunder over Utah. 125,000 tons of mineral dust, a veritable smoky curtain of copper. This man-made earthquake is the signal that sends empty ore cars on their way to load up, and it becomes necessary to lay whole sections of new track in order to reach the debris. 29 electric shovels stab the earth, giant steel dippers scooping six to seven tons of rock at a time, completely filling an ore car in the record time of five minutes. Yes, they move mountains here in Utah. And the parade of rock-laden cars starts for the Magna Mill. Part of the blasted material is capping or waste, but this too is utilized, being dumped so that water may flow through it, and in this manner capture certain chemical qualities with the power to transform tin can shavings into almost pure copper precipitate. In reality, these shavings are scrap iron, gathered in bales like hay. into a lengthy trough. Becoming saturated with the copper-charged water, the waste iron is magically converted into copper. 
Troves, technically called launders, deposit the solution in huge settling tanks, extending the length of the plant. At this stage, the precipitate is 89% copper and is ready to be transported to the smelter for the fiery baptism which will convert it into solid metal. We leave the precipitate and follow the ore to Magna Mill, where we witness an amazing operation. A carload of rock turned upside down like a toy in a powerful rotary dumper. Sharing our fascination is Colonel Daniel C. Jackson, active head of this stupendous copper enterprise. Tons of rock are catapulted into the crusher, looking for all the world like a huge coffee grinder, creating an ear-splitting roar. Conveyor belts carry the grist from crusher to crusher, each chewing the ore a little finer until mechanical classifiers divert any remaining coarse bits to the battery of ball mills. Pulverized to a fine consistency, the ore is mixed with reagents, becomes a pulp-like mixture, and is delivered to the flotation machines where the copper mineral is floated away from the worthless gang or rock and recovered as copper concentrate and then made ready for delivery to the smelter. Here, gold, strangely enough, is a byproduct of copper being caught in valuable quantities in these launders through which the mill tailings flow. Efficient mining and smelting of low-grade ore makes for continuous activity at the massive Garfield smelter, where more copper mat is produced than at any other place in the world. From one steel volcano to another, the fiery copper lava is drawn, rejecting all waste material or slag. The slag is skimmed off. It is poured into special metal dump cars. Then it is rushed to the slag pile, where it cascades down the side of an ever-increasing mountain of waste. Purged and purified, the stream of molten copper is molded into 450-pound blocks, cooling streams of water playing on the hissing, steaming oblongs. And thus, copper is born, born to serve mankind. Slender strands, metal arteries loaded with the lifeblood of industry, electric power. Hemispheres are linked. A world speaks. That's copper. Established in pioneer days as a bathing resort, Black Rock at the edge of the Great Salt Lake is still pleasure mecca for thousands who come to bathe and thrill in the waters of this inland sea. And believe it or not, you float like a cork. It is impossible lures thousands of visitors offering pleasure and recreational thrills. Dancing on the largest open air floor in the world and easy access to the Great Salt Lake by way of the Putt-Putt Railway, which works overtime carrying sightseers and salt-laden swimmers. Here, too, the waters of the Great Salt Lake provide seasoning enough for all the hard-boiled eggs in existence. Giant pumping plants syringe the brine through flumes, forcing the water into a vast solar evaporating pond. So immense are the salt beds that the human figure walking across them appears pygmish by comparison. Salt is an industry in Utah, and the major companies work the year round, supplying the demands of the world for this table necessity. Utah highways are pleasure ways, and this time lead us to Ogden, second largest city in the state. New Pineview Dam and Reservoir in Ogden Canyon does its part in creating expansive farms and orchards. And even the canyon itself is spanned by water coursing through a catenary pipeline nourishment that works hand in hand with sun and Utah mountain air to produce barley and wheat for the mills of the Beehive State. Here, plow and harrow have cut the earth. As far as the eye can see, waving stems of golden grain give promise of an abundant harvest.
Utah's ranges supply ample pasturage for thousands of Hereford and other cattle that graze and fatten on succulent grass. White-faced beeves keep alive and nurture the spirit of the Old West. Glowing embers, white heat, branding irons, cow hams still ride the Utah Trail. Great artists have been at a loss to properly catch on canvas the simple beauty of sheep serenely grazing. Woolly wanderers, almost a million of them, slowly moving from place to place, on intimate terms with the natural beauty that surrounds them. Sheep raising is a major Utah industry, yielding more than $20 million annually. Leaving Ogden, western terminus of the Rio Grande Railroad, we are thrilled again with the prospect of going places. This time to the throne of a desert empire, Salt Lake City. More than 90 years ago, covered wagons freighted with courageous men and women forced balky oxen over torturous desert routes. What a contrast. Steel-covered wagons powered with the might of thousands of steam oxen thunder over flashing rails. Carefree, speedy transportation, safeguarded all the way by Cyclopean green and red eyes. Ever alert signal towers, the mechanical mounted police of the steel highways. On we roll, past fertile acres shaded by towering peaks of the Wasatch Range. On to Salt Lake City, miracle metropolis that rose from dead desert sand. is just a matter of moments. Air brakes gently slow our train, while alert porters make ready to empty passenger-crowded vestibules into the busy Rio Grande station. Salt Lake City, commercially and culturally the lodestone of the West, a tribute to the foresight and wisdom of its founder, Brigham Young. Majestically situated on a rolling slope, Utah's magnificent granite capital is a fitting symbol of this great commonwealth. Each day at noon, except Sunday, visitors are treated to inspiring organ recitals in the tabernacle. Here, Dr. Frank Asper, renowned artist, interprets the works of the great masters on this historical organ, which contains 7,000 pipes. One could go on almost forever wandering through these friendly grounds, replete with symbols of Mormon history. No story ever told is so utterly amazing and dramatic as that miracle of 1848, which prompted this memorial to seagulls, the only monument ever erected to bird life in America. Picture, if you can, pioneers rejoicing over the prospect of harvesting their first crop. Without warning, hordes of crickets start devouring every green thing. Pioneers fight to save the precious grain. Discouraged, they offer prayer. Suddenly, the heavens are filled with flocks of seagulls who devour the crickets. And so a column is erected in remembrance of the mercy of God to the Mormon pioneers. People of many nations have gathered here. I was born and raised in this valley and was a passenger on the first Rio Grande train in the Salt Lake City more than half a century ago. The passing years have strengthened the thought I had then that these fertile valleys of the Rockies are a tribute to the industry, sacrifice, thrift, and courage of the pioneer men and women who founded this land of bountiful beauty. For the strength of the hills, we bless thee, our God, our Father's God. To fully appreciate Salt Lake City and understand its unique historical background requires far more time than the few brief hours we have enjoyed. Hours amongst people friendly and hospitable. But we face the inflexible reality of railroad schedules. And it's back on board. This time, the panoramic, eastbound over the Moffat Tunnel scenic shortcut. Phil, 
Utah is the Desert Empire.